Good afternoon, everybody. So we are back for the next session on some uh, academic presentations where the community is involved. I would like to introduce to you Godwin Yabawa. He's a senior research fellow, fellow from the um, Institute for Global Sustainable Development in uh, the University of Warwick in the UK. And we just figured out that he actually uh, studied together with one of my former PhD students. So I'm happy to hear that. The world is a small place. And Godwin um, is also a member or a fellow of the Royal Geographic Society, and he's interested in the assessment of and contribution to open. Hello, everyone. Quickly looking at sustainable development, and he's going to tell us about a huge project where he was involved in, where they uh, went in with communities into informal settlements and looked at the accessibility of the communities to healthcare services. So I would like to um, switch over now to. Um, of this presentation. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Godwin Yeboa, a senior research fellow at the Institute for Global Sustainable Development based at the University of Warwick in the United Kingdom. The title of my presentation is Examining Special Proximity to Healthcare Facilities in an Informal Urban Setting. This study is co authored by myself, Professor Joe Porto de Albuquerque who is the director of the institution where I work, and Dr. Olalikun John Taiwu, who is based at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. The logos of our collaborators are shown below, and that of our main founder is at the top right corner. As an overview, I will highlight our ongoing project, which is led by Professor Richard Lelfold, as well as the research questions which guided this study. Next, the methods used in the work will be presented. I'll then show some results and give some concluding remarks. The following research question served as a guide for this study. What are the differentials of special proximity to healthcare providers in informal settlements like slum? What are some of the lessons learned from using OpenStreetMap-based mapping approach for slum health research? These research questions are explored using an ongoing research project. The title of our ongoing project is National Institute for Health Research, Global Health Research Unit on Improving Health in Slums at the University of Warwick. The goals are to map health services and facilities and understand how these are used in slums across Asia and Africa. To build on these maps, to identify costs associated with how health services run in each site. To build models of health services and use these models to look at ways of improving health service delivery. Throughout these goals, we are collecting existing evidence and also involving people who can change things in slums, including politicians, civil servants, people who live in slums, an open street map or some community who can help generate quality baseline maps. The duration of this project is approximately four years ending in March 2021 and costing over five million pounds. There are five work packages designed to address the goals of the unit, cutting across um, geospatial mapping, household survey, evidence synthesis, health economics and stakeholder engagement. And the results in this presentation is mostly drawn from Work Package 1, which is about geospatial mapping of slums. It is important to note that the principal investigator for this project is Professor Richard Ledford, and Professor Joao Porto de Albuquerque is the lead investigator for the Work Package 1. There are five partners in the project, two in Asia, two in Africa, with the lead institution being the University of Warwick. In Africa, we are working with the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, where three slums are being studied. These are Shasha, Edikan, and Bariga. And we have also the African Population and Health Research Center in Kenya, where two slums are being studied, Kodogotu and Virondani slums. In Asia, we are working with the Aga Khan University in Pakistan, where Zambasti slum is being studied. And we have also the Independent University of Bangladesh, where Kurao slum is being studied. In this presentation, the results are taken from the green highlighted slum, that's Shasha. Shasha has relatively less dense buildings with density of about 1,700 buildings per square kilometer. The buildings are not that tall and mostly have uh, roofing sheets. Shasha is the biggest slum when compared with the other slum sites and is about one square kilometer. I will now talk about methods in this study. In terms of methods used in this study, an OpenStreetMap-based data collection approach was used to map and survey healthcare facilities, among others. The healthcare facilities were then grouped into four main categories. Special proximity and seniority measures were then 
computed to assess geographic access to different types of healthcare facilities. Discrete statistics were used to describe the computed spatial proximity measures, whereas personal correlation between network and Euclidean distances was also computed. Reflective exercise on lessons learned during the data collection was also undertaken. One thing we are doing differently is that we are systematically adapting OpenStreetMap to develop a specially regulated sampling method in health research in a multi-country informal urban setting. The study protocol is published and cited here. We frame the production of informal urban community data as an interdisciplinary methodological challenge and situate it at the intersection of special data quality on one hand and community engagement on the other hand. Traditional mapping techniques, such as those used by geomatics companies and uh, national mapping agencies, can produce spatial data with a high degree of adherence to spatial data quality standards. They follow strict guidelines and aim at a well-defined set of dimensions of spatial data quality. Example, completeness of map features, logical consistencies, positional, temporal, and thematic accuracies. However, the application of these methods is costly, and the technical expertise required excludes uh, inhabitants from the uh, poor urban communities from the process. In contrast, participatory mapping techniques, such as the ones used in the humanitarian mapping community, are uh, a good way to engage residents and local stakeholders in thinking differently about their relationship with environment and urban space. But the extent to which the resulting data matches quality requirements is often uncertain. Operating at the intersection of these two mapping traditions, we see an interdisciplinary problem space that is associated with um, a twofold uh, methodological challenge entrenched in one the promotion of um, effective um, engagement and participation of local stakeholders and residents of urban communities, with the goals of building capacity, empowering them for creating uh, local ownership, and ensuring the sustainability of uh, geographic data generated. And two, assessment and improvement of spatial data quality, in order to ensure that the resulting data is uh, able to capture intra-urban inequalities and be used as uh, trusted evidence for scientific research and policy making. To tackle this challenge, our approach is based on our participatory and collaborative mapping, but in addition to the uh, methods adopted by uh, similar existing uh, initiatives. The diagram here illustrates an overview of our OpenStreetMap-based participatory data collection approach. The first step involves uh, preparation activities where training materials are prepared and responsibilities defined for subsequent steps. Also, procurement of high-resolution satellite imagery, identification of slum boundaries, and setting up of online mapping platforms using humanitarian OpenStreetMap team tasking manager are undertaken during this step. Securing access to slum sites are negotiated here, and also the core research teams uh, in partner countries are trained at this stage. The online mapping stage involves using the mapping platform to conduct uh, training sessions and uh, mapathons to achieve complete uh, digitization of uh, the areas. We authorize mappers due to our license agreement with satellite imagery provider. The online validation stage involves correcting any errors identified during the online mapping stage by experienced mappers. The GPS field mapping stage involves using handheld GPS trackers to track footpaths and road networks in the area with the aim of validating what has already been mapped and also identify, identifying the uh, network. The collected data is used to uh, update the OpenStreetMap uh, database at the GPS digitization stage. We then use printed field papers to verify the structure geometry in the field while uh, recording a unique 13 digit uh, structure code and taking field notes using a tablet. We are using two key uh, open source tools on the tablet. Open Data Kit, Open Map Kit. Another open source technology being used outside tablet is the field papers. Um, the field papers are then scanned and uh, uh, used to update OpenStreetMap uh, database online. The structure codes and field nodes are kept separate from the OpenStreetMap database online. All sensitive data are stored in our Warwick Open Data Kit aggregate server. Only data declared uh, public by respondents are uploaded to OpenStreetMap database. We end the field activities with key, uh, three key um, surveys using the collected spatial data. Household health survey, healthcare facility survey, and an in-depth household survey. These are some photographs of the online mapping events in Bangladesh and Nigeria. Involving the local community ensures uh, capacity building and multi-level participation and mobilization. 
um, it is important to emphasize that uh, local knowledge is also relevant in these events, which allows um, on-screen validation of most uh, mapped features. We usually search for any OpenStreetMap um, or some community groups in the area and collaborate with them. At the time of mapping the study area, we did not find any existing OpenStreetMap uh, community to help, but the mapping events created awareness and interest among uh, local residents and uh, researchers. Bangladesh was completely different and has a very strong and visible OpenStreetMap community. Also, these are some uh, sample photographs of the fieldwork in Bangladesh and Kenya showing the involvement of the local community. More OpenStreetMap community uh, members in Bangladesh participated in the training, online mapping, and fieldwork done in Kenya and other countries. The following are the four categories of healthcare facilities studied. Four clinics and maternity centers, 22 patent medicine stores. These are facilities for selling a commercial product advertised as a purported over-the-counter without regard to its effectiveness. Five traditional faith healers. One eye health center or a facility where an optician is based. The raw total here is 32 healthcare facilities. Literature suggests two main schools of thought about special proximity. One school considers proximity as a distance measure that can sufficiently be described by quantitative or qualitative distances. The other school aims at developing proximity measures where distance becomes a modifying factor instead of the, the measure itself. This study is mainly about the former school of thought. So for each uh, healthcare facility in the uh, four defined categories, shortest route network distances are computed using the validated OpenStreetMap uh, route network. Similarly, the Euclidean distance are also computed. QGIS Network Analysis 2 plugin, which has implemented um, um, Dijkstra's uh, shortest path algorithm was used for the computation. Seniority index is defined as the total root network distance divided by the total Euclidean distance. I will now show some results. This map shows an example of an updated online OpenStreetMap data for the study area. As discussed in the webflow earlier, not all data declared public by respondents have been uploaded. But this uh, will be done by end of the project. On the left, you will see some of the hashtags used during the online mapping, validation, and grant routing stages. For example, hot um, OSM project number from the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team tasking manager, slum mapping, Warwick Uni, etc. At the middle is a selected map feature, which is the location of a, a market in the area. Shortest route network distances from most um, households to clinics and maternity centers are higher than the Euclidean metrics. Grand mean uh, for network distances is uh, 727 meters with a standard deviation of um, 299 meters. And the same for Euclidean is 549 meters with a standard deviation of 256 meters. The grand median for shortest route network distances is um, 766 meters and the same for Euclidean is 577 meters. The grand medians and grand means for the two metrics differ by over 100 meters. Similarly, our shortest route network distances from uh, most households to patent medicine stores are higher than the Euclidean metrics. The grand median for uh, shortest um, nest network distances is 573 meters and the same for Euclidean is 416 meters. The grand mean for the shortest route network distances is 579 um, meters with a standard deviation of 256 meters. And the same for Euclidean distance is 435 meters with a standard deviation of 219 meters. In this case, the grand medians and grand means for the two metrics differ by over 100 meters similar to the previous. Same trend here. Root network distances from most households to traditional and faith healers are higher than the Euclidean metrics. The grand median for shortest network distances is 589 meters and the same for Euclidean is 416 meters. The grand mean for the shortest root network distance is 589 meters with a standard deviation of 240 meters. And the same for Euclidean distance is 428 with a standard deviation of, of 198 meters. In this case, the grand medians and grand means for the two metrics differ by over 100 meters, similar to the previous. Shortest route network distances from most households to eye health center are higher than the Euclidean metrics. 
The median for shortest root network distance is 490 meters, and the same for Euclidean is 372 meters. The mean for the shortest root distance is uh, 503 meters, um, with a standard deviation um, of 204 meters, and the same for Euclidean distance is 374 meters, with a standard deviation of 168 meters. Clearly, for all categories, uh, the medians and means for the two metrics differ by over 100 meters. The following are some of the lessons learned from the use of uh, OpenStreetMap-based data collection approach. Where research teams uh, need to host own satellite imagery, effort must be made to investigate carefully options for both free and commercial tile services vis-à-vis -vis the imagery license. We provide here some examples of tile services we have come across. In this study, the tile service was provided by the imagery provider. Use of portable GPS devices alone do not work at the household level. Careful training of mapping tools are very vital for success of implementing um, ozone-based uh, mapping for health survey. Use of field papers played a key role in data collection and cleaning. However, using this technology requires careful planning. Online mapping of road network and uh, well-known monuments proved very useful for orientation in the field. Rooftop architecture of structures can create difficulty during mapping. Uh, security for mappers should be a priority and working with residents can be extremely helpful in this regard. Our OpenStreetMap based method advances humanitarian mapping practices and addresses the twofold challenge of achieving equitable community engagement whilst generating quality data for research and decision making. Ground truthing is essential for areas with high density of buildings. Field validated um, data completeness estimates are usually less than online mapping estimates. For buildings, less dense areas can reasonably be used as a sampling frame without ground truthing. Roads are easy to interpret, useful, and must be mapped during the online mapping stage. For roads, field validated data completeness estimates are usually more than online mapping estimates. Factors likely to influence quality comprise density, rooftop architecture, and mapping skills, among others. In terms of healthcare access in the study area, our study suggests that. Residents can assess healthcare facilities within a walking distance that is under one kilometer. Comparatively, clinics and maternity centers are farthest from most residents. Even in this category, one facility stands out as the farthest, which is Shasha Primary Health Center. Root network distances to healthcare facilities are longer than their Euclidean distances, but there is a significantly strong positive correlation between them. Overall seniority index is 1.16, suggesting that non-linear nature of network distances to healthcare facilities contributes to 16% more than the Euclidean metric. Finally, this study advances the evidence base on slum health towards achieving sustainable development goal 3 and promotes the use of OpenStreetMap-based mapping approach and data for slum health research. We consider the following as potential future opportunities for research. Understanding how different sociodemographic profiles of slum residents have different accessibility to healthcare provision. Um, application of theory of change approach in studying um, healthcare accessibility in informal urban settlements. Um, combining uh, participatory methods with automated methods like machine learning uh, for, for structure detection and population estimation. Here, the validated OpenStreetMap features can uh, serve as training data or validation data. Improvement of workflows and mapping tools in support of a methodological framework for geospatial mapping of health and well-being in urban poor areas. Lastly, extending impact through a potential future collaboration with local partners, OpenStreetMap community, and um, other researchers for data usage and further improvement. This research was funded by the National Institute for Health Research, Global Health Research Group on Improving Health in Slums. The views expressed in this presentation are those of the authors and not necessarily those of the NHS, the NIHR, or the Department of Health and Social Care. Thank you for your attention and also many thanks to volunteers from the OpenStreetMap community, as well as project partners, collaborators, and funder for making this study a reality.
Hello everyone, my name is Godwin Yeb. You're live for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Godwin. That was a really insightful uh, presentation and the questions are streaming in. So, uh, oh yes, I can see. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> you can have a look at them as you are reading them as well. So let's start with the first one. Uh, the topography. Did you uh, consider that? Because um, uh, I think it... Yeah, the name is gone now, but in, in Brazil, if you, as you know, the favelas are really, really steep, so one has to consider the topography. Was that a challenge for you? Yes, um, that was uh, something that we thought about. Um, and, um, you know, the uh, I think in our case, uh, especially for this particular uh, study, um, this area is quite um, um, different from uh, the case raised in this question. And uh, because of this, we did not really consider it. But I, I concur that this is really uh, important to consider when you're dealing with distances similar to what uh, we consider in comparison with Euclidean distance. So certainly, um, I agree that uh, in the favelas in uh, Brazil, then certainly, certainly, it has yeah. to be considered. And, and then what about um, security, if it related? Did you consider that? Well, this was the security of the mappers, not the community going to the health work, the health care. So yeah, exactly. So this is uh, something that um, we carefully consider because, um, um, you know, the 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 mappers, uh, we have the uh, two to three uh, members in the research core team. And then we have also uh, volunteers. And then some of them are already within the community. Some are also helping. So for example, um, not necessarily here, but in, um, or maybe let me just talk about this one. So here uh, in Shasha, you have uh, most of the mappers were uh, uh, mostly uh, postgraduate students from the University of Ibadan. And certainly not all of them were within the community, I mean, in terms of being a resident. So um, um, these were issues that, um, you know, we tried balancing their composition with local residents. And therefore, once people get to know that, you know, their own is within the team and they can easily relate, then uh, it made it very um, easy for, for us to um, address issues about security. But it's something that uh, I learned also on the project that, um, you know, the slum as we know it is not necessarily um, security free and you have to be very conscious of this. And also the fact that, you know, this is an area where um, uh, usually is considered as um, illegal uh, uh, or the people are usually considered as illegal settlers in, in some in some uh, situations. So usually they are very conscious of um, any new phase or any new activity happening there. So if you're mapping uh, these areas and things like that, you know, even mapping, then that's even more um, um, sensitive because then, you know, is the, the, the assumption is that you're you are collecting building footprints or land, um, uh, uh, you're demarcating the land or sort of thing to, uh, uh, to uh, cause some future um, uh, maybe relocation or something like that that they need to understand and things like that. Yeah, I can I can appreciate that. But on, on the other hand, also the security of the community when they go to a healthcare center, did you consider that? Because, I mean, it, it could be a very short distance, but a very dangerous route. Oh, yeah, certainly, especially for women and uh, women or, yeah, uh, females in the in the team and things like that. So... Um, yeah, certainly this is something that we considered and um, we discussed with uh, local partners to make sure that um, this is something that um, um, is addressed. Then uh, the next question is about careful training um, of mapping tools. You mentioned that this is very important. Uh, what are the lessons learned and best, best practices in terms of that? Uh, well, so, uh, so this one was quite interesting because the for us, in terms of, you know, it was not just like um, uh, what we, most people usually do that, you know, you just map and then you upload to the, uh, to the OpenStreetMap database and things like that. But we also wanted to use it for survey. So that's the key thing. You, so that means that the, if you take, for example, um, a household structure, if you map it, then you have to also find a way to link this to a particular code or something that you can use in a survey uh, format. So in our case, um, we had to uh, use um, a 13 digit, digit code um, uh, consisting of um, uh, the uh, first letter of the slum um, um, name, uh, field paper code or sheet uh, code, um, innovation area, last digits of our interviewer, 
uh, code, um, um, uh, serial numbering of the structures and things like that. So in a way, uh, once that is done, uh, we, we, we saw this as um, the resilient component of even for the, for the, for the mapping process, because then we, we were always um, able to uh, 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 go back and use um, the field papers sort of as a reference point to always trace the, uh, what has been mapped right from the you know the server and all the other data that we have uh, and even beyond that to the survey so that was very um, useful for that and also in terms of training I would say that you know because um, the other component of our um, uh, interest was to understand how all these uh, mapping tools open source mapping tools can be linked together to conduct this sort of uh, research uh, based uh, open source based um, data collection and, and survey so um, one thing is, uh, you know, the, the the people who are who are helping, especially the volunteers, do not have this tech uh, technical backgrounds, and so uh, even the idea of uh, jumping from one tool to another. So, for example, you start with Hot Tasking Manager, they eventually end up field papers, and then you go to Jossum, and then you you go back, and then you you know you go to ID Editor, and then they do it, and then you know. Then even with that, you have to generate tiles and all sort of things. So there are so many tools that we are trying to use. And um, this is something that um, if you're not careful, um, you can be in trouble in terms of the uh, the workflow. Yeah, I think your, your presentation also showed that you had a careful plan of the different tools and when to use them. Um, yes, yes, in exactly. That, in that uh, slide. Another question that's come up here is about, um, you mentioned mapping footpaths and roads. So, do you think this project made a considerable difference in the in the coverage in that area and the completeness, or was there already a good a great deal of uh, data before you started? Well, there are some few uh, data sets, especially for this one um, when we started, but uh, most of them hadn't been uh, validated. That's for the structures and some of the building uh, uh, road networks, um, and also even for the healthcare facilities. Actually, uh, it was completely. Um, not validated. So, um, because our, our end goal was also with the healthcare facilities, so um, this this was something that we uh, we have contributed. Actually, I wanted to even show before and after maps just to clarify this. But I think in some of my previous uh, uh, presentations, I think last year in the same uh, uh, state of the map conference, I think I showed some of them. Uh, so, um, but basically that is. But there were instances where, uh, for example, I remember the. The, I recall in, uh, in the case of Pakistan, the site in Pakistan, Mazambasti, there was absolutely nothing. Um, there were buildings, uh, road networks there, but buildings were about three or so. And then we, we had to uh, map everything from scratch. Wow. And, and just an estimate, the number of buildings? Thousands. Oh, yeah, thousands. So this one, I think the building structures were, yeah, in the thousands. Um, but I would say that, you know, um, in terms of structures, that's the case. But in terms of households, there's a, a difference between that. You know, the you have structures, all right. But then we are also interested in dwellings. So out of the mapped uh, structures, we tried also to um, uh, beyond the structure verification, identify also the dwellings because we needed the households, the allocations to do the survey. So I assume there were more households than dwellings. Or uh, yeah, no, there were more, certainly, certainly, yeah. There were mm -hmm. over a thousand households, but then the, the in terms of structures, the dwellings, the structures, or the structure of the households were, I think, around so almost 700 um, structures out of the thousands. But uh, uh, for the number, the households, there were more, because certainly, you know, you can have um, uh, more than uh, one or two uh, households in a structure. Yeah. The next question is, again, about the, the um, assessing the accessibility to health facilities. So this question is about whether the, um, the number of doctors or nurses uh, for the number of people in the vicinity was considered. So the size of that uh, health service. Oh yes, uh, so the, for the survey, we have um, collected a lot of data and probably that's also one of the reasons why we had to carefully design the workflow in such a way that most of the data will go into a private server and well encrypted um, database um, server. So um, yeah, we have we have we collected all sort of things: ownership, so, so, source of funding, uh, number of doctors, number of nurses, uh, pharmacies. Uh, so for example, the healthcare, healthcare uh, facilities, we collected things. Uh, 
categories like clinic centers, uh, dental clinic, hospital, secondary care provider, residential, nursery care facility, laboratory, pharmacy, or medical store, general shop or kiosk with healthcare products, transportation, uh, traditional and faith healer, and others. So there were a lot of categories. Uh, for this study, we just you sort of, is a super grouping. So we, uh, mm -hmm. we tried uh, uh, regrouping the, those from the raw data, but uh, uh, in terms of the healthcare survey, we have a lot of variables that we are considering uh, for publications now. For the study, yeah. yeah. So, so the next um, question is about, did you encounter spatial heterogeneities regarding possible drivers like socio-demographics, economics, or something? Um. Um, so for this um, study, for this one that I've just presented, it's just, uh, uh, it, I would say, early stages in terms of, you know, starting to explore the data that we've collected. Um, but in terms of the project, we have, in fact, that's one of the uh, objectives, um, I think, in the earlier slides that I showed, um, the, 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 I think is a, one of the um, objective, uh, it's actually a work package, um, which is to understand um, healthcare access um, or healthcare seeking behaviors. So we are developing uh, health economic models and things like that. So we are certainly considering all these. And uh, uh, certainly um, we want to also look at, um, like I pointed out in the future, uh, uh, opportunities for research. We want to look at how these uh, uh, measures are linked to um, um, social demographics that we've collected. Yeah. So somebody's commented here and saying that this kind of study shows or exposes or reveals the serious concerns when people that are COVID-19 infected have to travel or to walk to healthcare sites. Um, have you got any comments about that? I guess uh, this study happened long before we had the pandemic, but maybe there were other infectious diseases that you discussed. Oh, certainly. This is something that, uh, you know, the project is ongoing and uh, some of the work packages, there are other um, co-investigators um, um, like Professor Francis Griffith and for at the Warwick Medical School and um, other um, uh, experts on the project who are looking at um, uh, this, especially for the, I think, the last work package, which is about stakeholder engagement. So um, the the object, the strategy now has been uh, to uh, shift focus to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and uh, look at ways in which um, the study can help, um, especially in areas of uh, creating policy briefs uh, with even the maps and the, uh, the findings that we have. In fact, uh, some of the uh, stick, uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, in-country um, stakeholders, I put it that way, are also interested in the data that we have and we are interacting with them. Yeah, I can I can relate to that. I mean, we are busy with a study here also in an informal settlement to just review whether all these rules about social distancing and all kinds of other me measures that are being put in place, if and how these are even possible in some of these um, settlements. I think that's a huge challenge. Uh, oh, definitely. And I have seen uh, even... Uh, Lots of uh, news um, items around this, you know, how how with this, you know, well, uh, um, highly dense um, areas, um, how do they actually um, address uh, or adhere to social distancing that has been uh, distance measures or policies that have been put in place by uh, government uh, officials or the um, local authorities? So this is something that, uh, uh, yeah, um, is a hot issue now, uh, especially in slums, because you know, because of this. Um, high population or dense uh, dense population, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the way we know about COVID, you know, uh, um, one minister from Ghana said, uh, if if you move, it moves, you know. So um, so far as people are moving, and there are a lot of them in a particular place, well, you know, the they also move, and this yeah. is something that uh, actually for me is very interesting. That probably in the future we will look into this. Yeah, and I think it starts with basic things like access to water. I mean, if you have communal taps, sorry, my cat is joining us. Exactly. Very down. Yeah. Okay. Then I was I was also curious to find out you did this across the world. I think that's very interesting. So how did accessibility differ between the different slums? Oh yes, this is something that uh, we've started. Uh, we started looking at um, this is just um, the start of the study uh, in terms of you know um, accessibility um, uh, um, um, uh, studies or 
looking into the data that we have. So this is just uh, one that we've started with. And so we're going to probably look into, um, uh, you know, sort of a comparative study, in, you know, for in, you know, looking at the data we have for these seven sites. And and the challenges in terms of mapping in the different countries were they were they similar? Were they different? Oh yeah, very interesting. So many interesting things. I think we, in a way, uh, we did not exhaust uh, all the lessons learned actually uh, on the slides that we put there. But uh, this is something we are looking at to probably put together uh, best practices or things like that around the lessons learned. Um, but uh, yeah, for the sites, there were interesting um, um, uh, lessons that we've learned. Uh, so for example, if you take uh, Pakistan, uh, Pakistan has uh, tall buildings, uh, building uh, uh, structures, and uh, the uh, rooftop is slightly different uh, compared to the others. Unlike, you know, if you take, I don't know whether, uh, yeah, the, I, I think I show some pictures for uh, Shasha, uh, the the building structure and the roof, and it is quite standard in terms of, you know, uh, in terms of digitization and trying to trace uh, uh, structures, or uh, you know, read from the satellite imagery. But in their case, it was a bit tricky. And we didn't, actually, we thought we were doing a good job in the online mapping, and then eventually we realized that actually when we went to the field, uh, it was completely different. Um, uh, because then you know there you there you're there uh, at the you know looking at the building you can see the top but uh, but then you can't figure out even uh, what it means you know you can't you can what you've marked online you can't figure out what it is on the ground uh, you can see the block I mean with the road the road was road networks were very uh, useful because you could easily navigate but if the structure has stands uh, this is very difficult to um, sort of. Uh, 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 you know, figure out the households living in each uh, structure, and it's very difficult to figure out which structure is which, uh, and things like that from the map, uh, um, from the uh, paper online map that we uh, we, we uh, printed and went to, uh, took to the field. So, so I assume that's also why you had to, in those dense areas, go back into the ground truthing because um, what you see on the satellite image could, it looks like one building, but it could be a couple of buildings and a couple of houses. Awesome. Definitely, that, that, Definitely. That, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. So we put it there maybe for less dense areas. That's quite relative though, but less dense areas like Shasha, then maybe that's possible because, I mean, uh, you can easily see... Uh, uh, the the buildings and then you can easily uh, probably uh, figure out that uh, um, uh, you can uh, you can you can use it for surveys. But um, it also is quite dynamic. It depends on every site. For example, Bangladesh um, is a bit tricky because the the site the place is very dynamic, and uh, so you have to be careful in terms of um, uh, 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 using the data for survey without uh, uh, sort of uh, field validation. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, it's done. Um, yeah. Um, I had a question. Oh, yeah. You said something about um, uh, that GPS on its own. It was in one of your slides. GPS on its own doesn't work well. What did you mean by that? So you had to do field papers and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah. As well. Exactly. Exactly. That's what I meant. Uh, so the the GPS, uh, we tried uh, using it, and uh, it was a bit uh, difficult to you know, uh, 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 link this to every household. I'm using just the, the locations. And uh, and because also, you know, I, I think uh, uh, you're also in, in Geomatic, so you understand how GPS works. And uh, I think probably most uh, people uh, listening to us, uh, are those in the GIS um, um, uh, field. So the, the, the 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 structures because they are also dense and uh, the, the 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 sky is not that open enough to allow uh, the communication between the device and uh, and the satellites uh, above and so certainly uh, you get the false impression that actually you are mapping or you are at the at the, at the structure you've mapped you're clear on it but then you end up uh, seeing the point somewhere else so uh, because it's not really computed well um, so the accuracy is very um, bad. And so um, we used, um, eventually we, that was one of the reasons why we used field papers and also uh, one of the reasons why we used the tablets and uh, also um, uh, off uh, um, um, tile, um, sort of tiles for the for the tablet. So we loaded everything there after we had prepared it from the, um, uh, from the online mapping and the field validation, uh, field um, um, uh, validation, uh, ground truthing. So we put everything on, uh, 
on the on the tablet and then we went there. So the GPS, I would say technology was used just as a guide. So it was guiding us to roughly, you know, figure out in terms of orientation, you know, the roads were helping, but also the GPS helped to figure out roughly where you are. And then you have to interpret what you have you have mapped, you know, the paper and also the um, the um, the um, tires on the on the tablets to um, orient yourself and make sure that you are really um, uh, uh, seeing uh, the right uh, structure before you start um, recording or you start uh, collecting data. So um, that's why I think somewhere I mentioned or I put the um, that road networks or well known monuments were very useful. So you know once you get you get to that where you really you really sure you are well oriented and you know the position, then you can start from there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Godwin. Uh, I think we have to wrap up. We need uh, another few minutes of a, of a break before we go on to the, the next uh, presentation. That was really excellent. Excellent work that you're doing. Um, I think uh, I would like to encourage you to write that up because I think it's very useful for many people in other parts of the world um, to work out how to work uh, with OpenStreetMap and capturing these um, settlements. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for coming. Bye.